Chelsea, this is my channel, The Fancy Hat Lady Reads. I'm wearing one of my fancy booktube hats, and today I'm doing a wrap-up for the four books, only four, that I read over the months of June and July. This was the end of my very long dry reading spell. Um, I did pick up my reading again in August. You may have seen the two books that I held up in my thumbnail were both very small novellas. I also read two full-length novels, both of which came from the library. So the first book I read in June was this very small, it's actually I think a novelette, not a novella, um, and that is The Inconvenient God by Francesca Forrest. This is from a small press. I did really like this story. I gave it four stars, um, but I think if it were like a story in a collection or anthology, I wouldn't have necessarily said, oh, this, this one deserves to be a full bound book on its own. Nevertheless, the book is a very pretty physical object and I'm, I'm happy to have it. This takes place in a fantasy world with like contemporary levels of technology. There's like, um, you know, a personal communication device of some sort that the main character uses that has probably similar capability to a smartphone. There are things that are basically, as far as I can tell, motorcycles under a different name. And the main character of this is an official from the Ministry of Divinity for the empire that this takes place in. And the Ministry of Divinity is in charge of like regulating gods. And this is a world in which gods are real, they exist, they are powerful, um, and they, they can be regulated by the government. Specifically, our protagonist is a decommissioner and has been um, sent out to a university campus where they have a troublesome campus god who's like a very hyper local god of debauchery and mischief and bad grades that the university wants decommissioned. But when she gets there she finds that the job is more difficult than how it was represented to her, and so she ends up having to uncover the secret history of this god, which turns out to be tied not only to the university campus history, but also to the more prominent local god who is an apple goddess, and to the history of the colonization of the region where the university is by the Empire. I think this raises interesting questions about imperialism. The main character is, of course, from the imperialist government, and she's sort of put in a position of having to bend the rules and the official stance that she's supposed to stand by um, in order to actually address the root cause of the problem. So it's a very slight story with a pretty narrow scope, but a very interesting fantasy world. I know this does have a sequel novella that's a slightly longer book called Lagoon Fire that recently came out, so I'm interested to read that. And then the next book I read was a library book. This was Hollow Pox, The Hunt for Morrigan Crow. This is the third book in the Nevermore series by Jessica Townsend. This is a middle grade series that's very whimsical and imaginative about a girl named Morrigan Crow who gets whisked away to the secretive state of Nevermore, where she eventually eventually joins the Magical Wondrous Society. These books for me are page turners. They are chunky looking, but I find that the plot is fast paced and engaging and they go by really quick. I put off reading this book for a little while after it first came out because it uh, is a book that had the misfortune of being a, a book about a magical epidemic that came out during the plague year. There are sort of two distinct plot lines going on here. There's the plot line with Morrigan's second year as a student at the Wondrous Society and her struggles with the academic side of things, what she's supposed to be learning as a wondersmith, which is thought to be a very dangerous thing, how her strange status within the school affects her relationship with her classmates. Um, so that's the plot on the one hand, and the plot on the other hand is the magical epidemic, um, which I thought was handled in a really interesting way in this. Because it is a magical thing, which is affecting in this story animals, which are the um, animal-like people in this world. Anyways, because it's a magical thing and not like an actual science virus, it didn't have the problems where like we all sort of know how viruses work now in a way we maybe didn't know before and all the 
all the plagues in the plague books suddenly seem wildly unrealistic. I didn't have that issue because it is explicitly a magical thing here. The side of this that really did feel true to life and like the author had sort of hit the nail on the head a bit was the social side of the societal effects that a, a mysterious unknown illness um, spreading in a society can have. All of the ways that this book depicts the fear of the hollow pox really playing upon pre-existing divisions in society and making them so so much worse. The questions of public messaging during a crisis like this and what the effects are of the things people in power are saying. All of that messy ethical stuff that we've come to realize happens during a public health crisis, all of that felt really true to life for me. But the other thing I realized while I was reading this book that I always, I think I forget after I finish these books, um, is that Jessica Townsend's writing is just so funny. There were lots of laugh out loud moments in this that I really enjoyed. I gave this four stars, which is the same rating I gave books one and two. For me, this series is something I really enjoy so much uh, while I'm reading the books, but then in between books, when I'm not reading them, I don't think about them much. They don't stick with me afterwards. So it's a series I highly recommend, but not necessarily one that occupies a lot of my brain space in the time between book releases. Next is Fugitive Telemetry by Martha Wells, which is the sixth book in publication order in the Murderbot Diaries series. It's another novella, not a full-length novel like Network Effect. It takes place between the first four novellas and the novel. And in terms of its relationship with the, the plot arcs of the rest of the books, I would say you definitely should read the main four novellas first before reading this or you'll be very confused about a lot of the characters. But there is absolutely no reason why you would need to read Network Effect before picking this up. This does sort of feel like a side story to the main plot arcs of the series. The first four novellas really do build as an overarching narrative and Network Effect sort of feels like it's beginning another possibly major story arc, and this doesn't really belong to either of those story arcs. It is a murder mystery uh, that takes place on Preservation Station, and Murderbot has to team up with the head of station security, whom it uh, views very antagonistically. Murderbot has agreed to not access preservations like security systems for, um, you know, privacy reasons, and that makes it very grumpy. Murderbot sort of feels like, hey, I could solve this murder mystery in about 10 seconds if you would let me have access to all of the station systems. Why are we doing this the hard way? But Murderbot is nevertheless a very resourceful detective, so despite not wanting to work with these people and not wanting to do the job like this, Murderbot ends up doing some very high quality, extremely passive aggressive detective work. This was not my favorite in this series, in part because I felt like it didn't have some of the broader implications that other installments have had, but I still gave it four stars. I will say something that was unusual for me reading this as a mystery is that I actually did guess who done it before the reveal happened. As a reader, my instinct is not to try to armchair detective a mystery. My instinct is to sort of just let the reveals come to me. Um, but I, I did figure this one out mostly just by thinking of the list of the cast of characters and the themes of the series and what characters I would expect to have a more featured role in the plot who hadn't yet had an extremely featured role in the plot by, you know, two-thirds of the way through. Anyways, I will continue to read all the books in the Murderbot Diaries as they're released. We are going to get more of them, but I don't think we know yet at this point whether they're going to be full-length novels or more novellas, and I don't think we have a release date or any information about the next one yet. So 
We'll see. But nevertheless, Rare is the series where I actually keep up with new releases in the series, and I've got two of them in this video. Um, the Nevermore series, and Murderbot. And then the last book I have on this list, the only one that I read in uh, July, uh, is possibly the book of this batch that has stuck with me the most and sat with me the most since I read it. That was The Galaxy and the Ground Within by Becky Chambers, which is the fourth and final book in the Wayfarer series. I think this is supposed to be the conclusion of this companion series. Each of the three subsequent books following The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet have been a loose sequel to the first book. So if you've read the first book, you could jump to any of the other three in whatever order you want and not miss anything at all. The other three don't relate directly to each other in any way. And honestly, I would say for this one, The Galaxy and the Ground Within, and the previous one, which was Record of a Spaceborn Few, the connection to book one is such that it, I don't think it would spoil anything if you were to start with either of these either. In this one, the connection to book one is the character of Pei. She showed up in The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. She is uh, one of the major point of view characters here. And I'm just gonna say right up front, the thing I loved most about this book is that this was a uh, sci-fi novel in which pretty much no one was human, everyone was aliens. I think the other books in the series have very much focused on human characters in a world where humans are a minority species, and they've really highlighted the uh, interactions between humans and other alien species as major parts of the plot. But this is the first book in the series where humans barely feature at all. Humans are discussed occasionally. There is one human who shows up on the page late in the book in like one chapter. So this book takes place on a planet that basically serves as a transportation hub. That's all that's there is like stuff you need on a layover. Because this planet is like extremely barren and not very exciting but happens to be located by a bunch of uh, really useful wormholes. And the novel specifically takes place at the Five Hop One Stop, an extremely humble operation run by a mother and child of the Laru species, where they try as best they can with their limited capacity to be inclusive to members of all species who might visit. Three different visitors from three different ships are all staying at the Five Hop One Stop, when uh, there is an infrastructure collapse around the planet that takes down the planet's satellite network and grounds everyone for several days. For context, I read the majority of this book while traveling myself. I had to take a very unplanned emergency trip uh, to deal with some family stuff that was going on, um, and so I was personally in a headspace where I was very stressed and thinking of sort of different levels of crisis and how you decide to adjust your behavior based on what you perceive the level of crisis to be and how that can be in flux. And that's very much a central idea in this book as well. The crisis that happens in this book, being stranded on this planet with this group of people for several days, is a vastly different scale of crisis for the different characters involved, um, depending on how urgent their travel is, whether they've left someone on their ship that's orbiting the planet who might need them desperately. In the case of the host family, this is of course the most frightening and potentially catastrophic thing that could possibly happen on this planet where they live. If you're Pei, who works in a war zone, this feels like nothing. This feels like, oh, just gotta sit here for a few days and relax. Does that level of crisis suddenly change if there's a medical emergency and you can't contact emergency services? So this is a very contained and introspective science fiction story. I really loved it. I appreciated, because I was traveling and stressed and dealing with a crisis, that it was 
pretty easy to read. I often have a hard time reading anything if I am A, traveled or B, stressed, and this was just a very inviting book to sink into. I really enjoyed all of the characters. It had just enough personal stakes for all of the characters that I was very invested without any like big high stakes action things going on. I gave this four stars. I wonder if I maybe was a little stingy, if this maybe should have been a five star read for me. I've given four stars to all of the books in the Wayfarer series. Wow, this is a third series that I'm all caught up on in the same wrap up. Um, but I do have favorites within the Wayfarer series. My favorites are uh, closed in Common Orbit, the second book, and this one. I think if we take this as the conclusion of the series, this is a really strong conclusion that people who've liked the previous books are going to love. Anyhow, that's it. Those are the four books from June and July that I read. Let me know if you've read any of these. Let me know if you're reading any of these series that I am, surprisingly, all caught up on. Let me know what you think. Anyhow, I hope you're having a very nice day. That is all. Bye for now.